Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Amanda Kramer and I am the Alumni Engagement Program Manager at the University of Colorado Boulder's LEED School of Business. Welcome to our ninth webinar series. We have certainly faced some trying times over the past year and a half and here at CU Boulder we have gathered our world-renowned faculty and alumni to provide frank and timely insights to help you learn and navigate these times. Today is the second of four webinars in this webinar series. To view upcoming webinars, please visit our website at colorado.edu slash business slash alumni. Click the drop down arrow and click attend online webinars. For today's webinar, we're so excited to welcome Meredith Bear, CU Boulder alumna and founder of Meredith Bear Home, here presenting the future of the real estate and design industries, how COVID-19 has reshaped our concept of home. A few housekeeping logistics before we begin. First, if you have any questions now or during the presentation that you would like to ask Meredith, please send a question through the Q&A interface. We will monitor questions as they are submitted and Meredith will respond to them at the end of the presentation. As a reminder for optimum audio quality, we do have everyone on mute except for myself and our speakers. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please notify us through the chat interface and one of our support specialists will touch base. Lastly, a link to access the webinar recording will be sent to all registrants tomorrow, along with the survey link and supplemental resources from today's presentation. Now, I'm excited to introduce Francie Wojcik, Director of Development in the College of Media, Communication and Information at the University of Colorado Boulder, who will be moderating this presentation with Meredith and who will introduce Meredith now. Welcome, Francie. Thank you, Amanda. It is absolutely an honor to introduce Meredith Fair and to get to speak with her today. Meredith's career has taken many twists and turns since she graduated from CU Boulder with a journalism degree. She is most famous for her work at her business, Meredith Bear Home, which she launched in 1998. Meredith has been credited with essentially inventing the now common and popular practice of real estate staging which has had a tremendous impact on the real estate industry. Meredith Bear Home is the number one home staging firm and her houses sell faster and at significantly higher prices than unstaged homes. Meredith's magic touch transforms the place from builder basic to absolutely awe-inspiring as you'll see in the pictures today. She has designed homes all across the country and abroad as well. Meredith's creativity, impeccable style, and extensive expertise have made her sought after by the top real estate firms and tons of private citizens, including many of the celebrities that we hold dear. More on that later. Meredith and her firm were featured in the HGTV show Staged to Perfection a few years ago. Her work has been featured on ABC, CBS, NBC, Bravo, and Discovery Channel as well as within the pages of Architectural Digest, El Decor, Forbes, and pretty much every major newspaper in every major city. We are truly honored to boast Meredith as a CU Boulder alumnus. Meredith, thank you for being here today. Oh, it's such a pleasure. It's really exciting. Talk about coming full circle. Absolutely. Um, and I know our audience is really excited too. Um, I know that we have a few slides that we'll go through, but before we begin those, I thought that we would start with the most common question that I get asked about, which is, you graduated from CU with a Bachelor of Science in Journalism, and now you are just this amazingly famous and talented and successful designer. So how did you end up in design and staging? Well, it was all an accident. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it, it was the, a very, very odd uh, route that I took, um, starting with as I was graduating from CU, the, like almost on the day, um, Jerry Bruckheimer, the, the renowned producer, came up to me and asked me to be in a Pepsi commercial. And I went, oh, yeah, right. And, and I, I did it. I, they started sending me money like crazy. I couldn't figure it out. And I uh, ended up moving to New York and, and trying to get a job in journalism and uh, ultimately ended up making a lot more money making television commercials. Uh, but I still, I kept writing and the commercials, I ended up going up for 
movies and television roles, even though I hadn't studied and didn't have all that much talent and uh, got a lot of them, but I'd read these scripts and I'd think, oh, I can do that. So I started writing movies and became a screenwriter. And then I found myself living in a cute little house and redecorating it to avoid writing. And, uh, and the owner of the house came to town and said, I love what you've done. Um, you're going to have to leave because I'm going to sell it and make some money on what you've done. And I went, oh God. And a friend of mine was trying to sell a house. And I said, how about I move my furniture over to your house so everyone could see the lifestyle and get an idea of how they'll live in the house, which I sort of made up because I figured I'd save money on storage. And sure enough, really? the house sold in a couple of days for half a million over asking to the head of one of the studios. And every broker in town started calling me, will you, will you do this for me? And I went, uh, sure. And when I started off, I said, I'll do it. If, um, if I could live there, uh, I'll charge you a lot less money. So I was moving practically every month for a couple of years. And that was the, that was the beginning of my business. That's amazing um, and so creative. We now do about 2,000 houses a year and I have 300 employees and we're all over the place. So I honestly, it was truly an accident. It's amazing. I'm glad you're not moving into all 200 houses anymore. Oh boy. Yes. I, I'm glad that part of it's over. <laughs> so this first slide and image we're looking at this is stunning. And I have some major envy about those windows, especially. That view is pretty uh, irresistible, yes. Absolutely. Um, tell me about this room. It feels like it's both sparse and glamorous all at the same time. Yes, and it's sort of the new style of glamour. If you notice, there aren't a lot of shiny surfaces. Uh, a lot of people identify with, with glamour. Um, especially in, in recent years, we, you know, there aren't a lot of, uh, you know, the, the bases are wood, the table is wood. Uh, so that I think the modern glam is incorporating more natural pieces these days. It's beautiful. I like the curved furniture too. Yeah, that seems to be the new trend is at least certainly in the last, I would say nine months to a year is much more of a rounded shape. For a while there, everything was square. And now, now things are getting rounded. It's beautiful. But of course that won't last either, nothing does. Right. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Um, okay, so this room, I love this one too. I basically just wanna move into all of these. <laughs> this to me is kind of more earthy than the last one we saw. And yes, exactly. Simple color palette here. Um, yes, it's, very, it's, it's a very soothing, very soothing palette and, you know, kind of a mixture of some sort of ethnic accessories and, you know, the, the base of the coffee table is like a, is an aged uh, metal and there's a little leather and so forth. Lots of leather, like the, these hides have become very, very popular. They feel good on the feet if you're barefoot and, uh, and then a lot of the, pillows are hand woven so it's textural uh, so so the uh, a lot of the a lot of the sumptuousness comes from the textures here it's gorgeous is it is a kind of more muted color palette more favorable usually in staging i i think generally i i certainly like to st always start with the muted palette and and perhaps you'll then bring in um, a big bang of color but I, I think for me, I like, I personally like living with more muted colors. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if I'm going to bring in color, it'll generally be with the art or perhaps a rug. Now we're having some fun, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, this is so funky. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, well, it is funky, you know, and it's, this is, I, I'd say, you know, a lot of people just like an eclectic look and just to surround themselves with things they found over the years here and there and put it all together. If you notice that the artwork is modern, mm -hmm. um, but then there's sort of a rustic chair and uh, some very old antique pillows and an antique Persian rug. So 
interestingly enough, I really think if you if you like the eclectic look, the all, the key to creating it is simply finding things you like to look at and, and live with and <laughs> put them together. <laughs> It works. That's easy, an easy formula to follow. You know, yeah. right here, like matches necessarily, you know, yes. it all feels like it goes together. Well, interestingly, I, I think that if, if, if you really just pay attention to what you like and what, what you enjoy and what feels good for you, it's all going to work. Okay, I'll so <laughs> this is a bit of a departure, still has a lot of personality. But there's some great color here. Yes, I, I think for those people who do like color, you know, just knock it out of the park. <laughs> Give them color. And I think it ends up feeling very young. And, and uh, you know, if you do like color, you know, I think you just have to sort of pick, pick your lead, pick the main color you want to feature, and then sprinkle it through the room. That makes sense. It looks great. And I like how the pillows sort of echo the chairs. Right, right. And there's a little bit of orange in the artwork. And so just, and the rug, the rug picks up the same oh, color. Yeah. So I think if you're going to go with the color, just make sure that you sort of weave it through in, in a subtle way. Okay, so this, I just imagine like a very swanky bachelor living in this house. Yes, for sure. This one has a very, uh, very masculine vibe, doesn't it? I mean, even the, the wolf, the uh, the predator there. <laughs> I happen to love wolves, but um, you know, the leather, the, uh, you know, the dark lamps and, and even the, even the pattern of the, of the rug looks like a man's shirt. And, uh, and yet, you know, there, there's some, you know, there's textures in the chairs and so forth, but this is a much more natural way to go. And it's very much a black and white theme with variations on those colors. So this is so elegant. And with this image, I was wondering that marble wall, was that existing in this space or was that something that you installed? No, that was existing okay. and it's, it's a strong element. Uh, so, and, and it's, you know, it, so we, we went out of our way not to duplicate that element anywhere when we, when we did this home. So we brought in some woods and, and a textured rug and, and um, some leather and so forth to kind of soften the room. Because overall now the room looks very soft, even though there's that hard surface that's featured. Yeah, and the, with the fireplace and the blankets, it feels like it's cozy, even though you have this one really cool, both visually cool and literally. Like right now in this heat, I just want to press up against it. But yes, yes. And I mean, don't you want to cuddle with that chunky blanket there? Absolutely. Sure? Or with someone maybe, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so when I look at this one especially, I just see so many textures. How do you incorporate different textures in a way that's so successful like this? Well, I, I think that the background, because the background is, is so muted, whites and creams and so forth, and the rug, I think you can bring in all kinds of textures and, and surfaces. You can see the woven pieces, uh, the leather pieces, and it all works when you have a more neutral background. Um, that's why I love starting with a neutral background. That's beautiful. Um, we did have a question in the chat asking where some of these homes are located. So I would say this looks to be uh, Southern California, I would say. Um, uh, I'd have to go back, but, but we our main locations are all over the East Coast. Uh, you know, Manhattan and the Hamptons and uh, Connecticut, New Jersey, all over the West Coast. We're in Northern California, Southern California, and everywhere in between. And then we're uh, in Florida. So those are our main areas, but we will pack up a, a, a container and ship it to, we've done Chicago, we've done Atlanta, we've done actually many countries that way. So I would say probably the, the, the majority of the houses will either be on the East Coast, West Coast, or uh, Florida. Beautiful. But I'll try to identify them going forward for you. Perfect. If you them. know, if you know, 
I know there's, you've done a lot of them, so. Yes. Okay, so this. This is Northern California. Oh, nice. Um, so this one, like there, it's so, there's so much wood and rustic. And so it kind of feels different from a few of the other ones we've seen today, which just sort of, sort of goes to show how versatile it is. Yes, yes, I think I would call this rustic modern. Mm -hmm. um, the chairs are mid-century and the table is a, is a, is a, just a big slab uh, of wood, which is just mm -hmm. fabulous, I, I love. And the ball's the same, it's all live edge. And then the chairs are contemporary, you know, with that rounded look again. And, uh, and then there's some texture in the rug. So it's, it's, it's a modern space, but yet it's warm and rustic at the same time, which I think is the kind of the new modern lately. It's I think people have gotten a little bit tired of all the modern homes looking alike and having that same quote unquote modern, exact same modern furniture. And this one inspired another question in the chat. Um, the question is, I noticed that you were successful in furniture pieces being partially on carpet and partially on wood or tile floors like we see here. When you lay um, this out, and do you already know what furniture piece works with the uneven floor conditions? What are your thoughts on this? The, no, no I, I'm sorry, w works with an uneven what? The uh, the uneven floor conditions, how it, it's partially on the rug, partially on oh, the- Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Well, generally, um, a rug will define a space. So that will tell you this is the dining area. And I think the rule of thumb with rugs is you want the furniture to it all to at least be touching the rug. So if you if your rug's a little small on the smaller side, but you still really want to keep it, that as long as at least part of the chairs are touching the rug, it can work. But you kind of think as a rug is there to kind of define the space or feature the space. You don't want the rug to be like an island in the middle of the room by itself. That's right. Yeah, and then all the furniture on the sides of the room. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this room to me has kind of that farmhouse-y feel. Exactly. It's, uh, which is so hot right now. And we actually had a question on this topic submitted in advance. Um, and so the, the uh, audience member wrote, what architectural style do you foresee to be most popular in the future? In our region, modern and farmhouse style and or modern farmhouse style have been extremely popular for the last couple of years. Do you think they have staying power or will they go out of style soon? Well, you know, that's always a good question and I don't have a crystal ball, but I, but my feeling is that trends come and go. That sort of East Coast traditional was the big star about five or 10 years ago. And then the, the modern farmhouse has kind of taken over, you know, in the fifties, it was the ranch style house. And I think, uh, I just think we know that trends will always be morphing and changing. Um, I, I happen to, you know, to love this style for now, but I, I think you can just assume that every style will change or morph as time goes on. That makes sense. You know, what's in, what's a hot, you know, even in, it seems like the 80s style and 90s style has come back around. So. Right. It's the same with music, dancing, everything that things change. Absolutely. So I have a question on the accessories and kind of the little details in this space. Those shelves are really just a great place to showcase things. How do you select and incorporate kind of those little finishing touches? Well, you know, I, th I think that that design has really gone global. And I, I think that people get excited about having things from all over the world. So when you add just some things that look unusual, that clearly didn't come from, you know, the store down the street. Uh, I think it just adds interest to the room. So we, you know, I, I spend much of my life traveling all over the world with a, a few people in my group looking for treasures from everywhere. And so our warehouse is just packed with it. And then we have 30 or 40 designers. They go in and they 
decide what they want this house to be or what it feels like it should be. Houses do speak. <laughs> like we saw with the marble wall one sometimes yes the, sure yeah you sort of say okay marble wall i hear you, you <laughs> dominate, but now i'm gonna soften you and 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 in this room you know has all that beautiful light coming into it from all these windows and i think it wants to be light and bright but i think i think some of the decor items anchor the room a little absolutely so I love the light fixtures in this room. Like they're oh, they fabulous. Expected. They're gorgeous. Um, what makes them work in this whole room? Well, I, you know, I think we have, first of all, we have uh, the walnut cabinets, which is a, a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a throwback to the 50s and 60s and the chairs match that. But I think you have, you have the metal uh, in the fixtures and then it gets softened with the upholstery. But I think the, the room really reads modern. Um, and, uh, and, and just a little bit of, a little hint of, you know, mid-century as well, which is very popular right now um, with all the walnut. But uh, uh, the, the fixtures is kind of bring a glam to the kitchen, don't they? Absolutely, and just another color and um, material they and, and also it's kind of unexpected we like to stick mirrors even in a kitchen like this just to you know it just again it reflects outdoors it reach it reflects other parts of the house and why not have a mirror in the kitchen i thought that it was actually a window at first it looks like it right yeah it really makes the space feel bigger too okay so this bedroom so I, I feel like this looks so good and comfortable, but I feel like I've always heard a design rule of not mixing black and blue. That's what's happening here and it looks fabulous. Well, rules are made to be broken, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I've been seeing a lot of mixing of, of the black and blue and different shades of blue with black and white. Actually, when you have a black and white base, you can bring in a specific color. I think you only want to bring in one usually, but you can bring in a mustard yellow or a blue or a deep green with it. And here we're mixing um, also some styles. If you notice the, the, the bedside tables and the chairs are antique and rustic. The art is very modern as, as are the uh, chaises here. And then you have that rustic, uh, woven uh, pillows and throw. Uh, so they're, and the, the lamps are very modern and curvy. So it's it's a mixture of styles. And, but by the way, in terms of the black and blue, you know, just make a rule and it'll be broken. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this one, we know where it is and who owned it, Meryl Streep in New York City. Yes, yes. And I mean, how exciting, um, you know, to to stage a home for such a, you know, amazing, talented woman. Um, and we just, you know, we just wanted to bring some um, some down to earth glamour to her home. And so we have this, you know, man floating off in, into the earth, into the stratosphere. And uh, you know, mixtures of metals and textures again with that gorgeous uh, Manhattan view. Isn't that beautiful? It's and absolutely then all that greenery outside. You know, with with the background of the city, it just is not what you expect in Manhattan. Completely. And we have a, um, a listener submitted question. Um, I see that you feature windows often in a space that looks over a yard or garden, like this one, but maybe one where privacy is needed at night, what do you recommend? Shutters in adjacent, we have shutters in adjacent rooms, but I don't want to lose the daytime view. I mean, I think shutters are, are, are an option or, or some kind of dark out shades, but I mean, windows and light are everything to a home. I mean, you've got to get, you've got to allow the light in during the day. Uh, it, it, it's what makes you feel good. 
And so, but, but I do think, I mean, shutters or any kind of blinds where you can, you can play with, where you can play with the light, I think are, will work. Okay. So this house was bought by a, a celebrity with a totally different vibe, I would say. <laughs> um, tell me about what the, what were the elements that Justin Bieber loved about this room? Well, I think that, that he could picture himself here because he's not a real formal guy. And yet the room's so elegant and he's, you know, he's a class act. So I, I think the room kind of incorporated a lot of uh, we, natural fibers, some leathers, some, some wools, um, but a lot of just, you know, clearly he liked how interesting a lot of the pieces were and the way they all came together. Uh, um, but I mean, I could see him living here in a minute. And all of this, you know, I'm sure people are constantly sending him framed pictures of himself and just the fact that he just sort of stacks them against the wall, just how casually he is about his fame. It's so funny. I love that. Okay, so this room just feels so large and, um, you know, kind of oddly shaped. How, you know, but you made it feel so cozy. Is it hard to stage in kind of, you know, to work with, architecture that's you know a little bit um unusual like this kind of octagon feeling space we love a challenge <laughs> I, th I think you know and again you know a, ro a room speaks to you uh and and i think you know if you have a really big room and you need to fill it you have an awkward space stick a piano in there right <laughs> absolutely uh, i mean um, in this case, our designer, you know, put a, put a white piano, which is sort of uh, not expected, real, and all of a sudden it makes it makes it look like this room was meant to be this shape to fit all of these items. Um, yeah, it is. It, it is. It, it was essentially, you know, initially, hmm, and then you just have to listen to the room speak, and uh, ultimately it all came together with again with textures and the pillows and the throws with the with the wood uh, piece of art and and so forth you know and it works and I also think the piano adds just it makes the room feel very important yeah the piano also sort of tells you just how big the room is like how much yes. this is in there that it is there taking up a footprint but doesn't seem oversized exactly exactly so I think this is our last room, and it just seems so relaxing to me. I this want is Malibu. Oh, Malibu! Well, yes. that makes me want to just lay on that sofa and take a nap, even right more. <laughs> after your swim, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get some afternoon sun and uh, and take a snooze. Um, is it intentional to make some rooms feel kind of? serene and comfortable like this when you're staging yes i th i think the whole point here was was to even the statue you can just sort of see she's just so relaxed and heavenly um i think the whole point here with this room was to make it feel like an oasis like a spa absolutely it feels very um just calming it's probably somebody's second home. I don't want to hurt everyone's feelings, but you know. <laughs> they're not there. They're not there twenty four seven, at least. <laughs> that makes me a little less envious. <laughs> um, well, thank you for sharing all of those beautiful rooms with us and diving into some of those design choices. Um, now we have a bunch of audience questions, and um, some that were submitted prior to this webinar. Um, if there's anyone in the audience who would like to submit more questions, please do so using that little Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And we're going to try to get to as many as we can. So since this presentation is part of our COVID-19 webinar series, we thought we would be with one of the pandemic related questions submitted. Um, thanks to vaccines and the easing of restrictions, Many of us are starting to travel and entertain visitors in our own homes once again. What are some kind of quick and cheap fixes that you recommend to get homes looking their best and kind of visitor ready um, after over a year without any gas <laughs> practice? 
Well, I mean, I, I always think the, the quickest fix to bring up a home is, is a nice coat of paint. You know, if, if it's in need of paint, spend, and you have a limited budget, I say spend your money there. But I think during COVID, we were all sort of, you know, cuddled up in our blankets and working with, you know, God knows. So I think like you might want to just kind of take all that junk you've collected around you and throw it in a closet and then deal with it when you have a chance <laughs> and uh, uh, just straighten it up, you know, get rid of the things that don't really make your eyes happy. Uh, but I think what we all, one of the things we all learned during COVID was how much home means to us and how much we want to sort of have it wrapped around us. And uh, everybody seems now really eager to get their houses, you know, looking great and to be, to be comfortable. And also we learned we needed the houses kind of to be our workplace. Mm -hmm. So we needed to think about the utility of each room, you know, what we want to do in each room how we could use each room, you know, where the office will be in each room. If there are a couple of us or four of us or five of us that need a desk, where will we all be working and doing our Zoom calls? Um, you know, you, you, as you mentioned that, um, everyone, you know, just tells me that the home improvement industry has been booming. Our all the charts. It's everywhere. Our contractor says he's booked out until, you know, January. Um, and I think I'm assuming some of this, at least for me, is driven by staring at the same walls all the time and dreaming of what could be better. Do you think that this boom is going to continue for the foreseeable future? You know, oh, I think I think it will. I think I think you're not alone. I think everybody's contractor is is booked. Our business, we I have never in 23 years seen uh move outs take place so fast houses sell so fast we've had houses we've moved out sometimes two days after we've staged where people just say i want it i want it now i think i think that people are home hungry and i think being home you're you're seeing the flaws you're going you know i always wanted to do this i'm gonna do it now they're sort of they were sort of faced with everything they didn't like about where they lived everything they want to fix you know, what they want their home to be because we've been staying in them nonstop. Absolutely. Um, you know, and so we have a question from a remodeler currently thinking mm -hmm. of remodel. Uh, I am remodeling a bathroom. I prefer showers over baths and, but I am wondering about the resale value. Should I remove the tub for my own personal preference to shower instead? Or should I keep the tub in there to attract the next buyer? That is a very good question. I, I, I mean, an excellent question, actually, because first of all, it's going to depend on, is this the home of your dreams where you want to live for the rest of your life? In which case I'd say you should consider doing it. But most people seem to pop around, you know, they, they, they only plan on living in a home for a few years or four or five years. I think if you're not going to live there for 10 years, I would say don't spend the money and do it. Because first of all, you'll probably be hurting the resale value to not have a tub. So I would say grin and bear it for the sake of making more money when you sell it. Unless it's the home of your dreams where you want to live for the rest of your life. Absolutely. Um, you were talking about how just these homes are selling so fast and I cannot even imagine the of bringing in furniture and then moving it out two days later. I mean, it served its purpose, but wow. Um, do you think that, you know, why are like things going so fast and do you think it's going to last? Well, I, I, think, I think part of the reason homes are selling so fast is that interest rates are lower than they've ever been in any of our lives and most likely will never be this low again. I'm pretty certain they will be going up and um, if you can grab a good interest rate, you know, it's going to cost you a lot less for the rest of your life to live in your home. So I think that's one of the main reasons uh, that houses are selling so fast right now. So I think as, as we head into an inflationary period and interest rates do grow, go up, uh, I think that it won't be so insane. Absolutely. That makes sense. 
Um, we have some businessy questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so first of all, um, how are interior, so interior design and staging are complementary businesses, but how are they different and what are kind of the pros and cons of those two separate entities? Um, well, um, staging is specifically uh, for helping homeowners and real estate brokers sell their property for the best price as fast as they can. And uh, whereas interior design is really about realizing the exact dream of an individual. And uh, sometimes the person walks into the house and the staging is exactly what they imagined they wanted to live with. And we are more than happy to sell them the furniture as is or sell it to the next door neighbor or <laughs> down the street. But, um, um, you know, interior design can be a very, very slow process where you're picking fabrics and every little thing. We, we also invented a new product called the Luxury Lease, where we'll lease people furniture per what they want to live with, to, you know, instead of doing interior design. Or we also started doing something called an instant home which uh, we basically get all of their needs, figure out their taste, and then install a whole home of furniture for them, give them a, a price list, and they have 48 hours to figure out what they want to keep. And then we can do another delivery or two or turn the balance of what's left into interior design. So I do think people are used to things happening fast. They want it now. So in that respect, I think more and more people don't want interior design. They want something immediate. That makes sense. Um, and especially in our culture of, you know, information access all the time and two day shipping. Well, exactly. And we've just gone through a period where, you know, where we went from running from one place to another, to another, to another, to being still for probably the first time in our lives for, <clears throat> excuse me, for a lot of people. So, you know, that's a new experience. Absolutely. Okay, so I think this next question, also from an audience member, is perfect for you um, because of your own background. Do you have advice for someone who is contemplating switching a career from law to design? I have an undergrad. From law? Law, yes. I law. love it. <laughs> I have an undergrad BFA. I have been asked to design homes for a few people and who have seen homes that I have designed for myself and family members. Um, can you talk about the pros and cons of starting your own company versus working with an established designer first? Oh, that's interesting. Well, well first of all, I, I have to say, I, you know, I, I love the position you're in because that's exactly how I found myself. I loved writing when I loved it, but I realized I loved design more. And one doesn't have to do the same thing for the rest of their life. You know, we can have different careers in our lifetime. So I think um, it, it I, I think it's a really good question. You might want to start by working for a firm. Um, uh, if you if you sort of want to learn how interior design works, if it's specifically interior design you want to do. Um, uh, to start your own firm, if you have a couple of big jobs, you also could probably do it on your own and uh, hire people around you that for assistance and so forth that have experience doing that. But it might be a good idea to work for a firm initially, just to get, you know, the ins and outs from them sort of seeing how the business works firsthand. And I think learning the lingo would be so convenient that way. Yes, yes. Um, another question from someone who has a home staging company. What advice do you have for how to get clients? I know you did a lot of word of mouth at the beginning of your um, journey. Uh, well, how to get, I, I, I'm assuming um, the person asking this question maybe means initially when they start, mm -hmm. I would say you want to get your first couple of jobs and, and give it your all 
and sent pictures around to brokers. I, I think in the staging industry, um, I would say 75% of our work comes from the real estate industry. So you go ahead, get some jobs installed, and then send invites to all the brokers mm -hmm. to see your work. I think that would be the best way. Later, you know, after people work with you, they'll just come back and come back and come back. And we work with a lot of developers who just use us over and over and over and over. When we have one developer, we do 100 jobs a year for. That's great advice and really practical. Having someone come in and see your work in person. That's what you want. It's just you want to get people there. And, uh, you know, probably initially you might want to bid a little bit lower than other people just to start getting more work. And then you raise your prices later. Yeah. Um, so now we have some kind of more design type questions. So someone in the audience today asked, do you incorporate feng shui in any of your designs? Um, not specifically, but when I say that rooms speak, uh, I really mean it. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think that most of the designers in our group will tell you that they kind of feel when the room is right and what it wants to be, that a plant doesn't want to be there and a, and a, a light doesn't want to be there and a sofa doesn't want to be there and a bed doesn't want to be up against a window. So I, I think we don't use the specific teachings of Feng Shui, but we definitely work with that concept uh, because I do think you just, if you feel a room, you feel it, you know, you know what it wants to be and and you, you'll you put something in a spot and you'll kind of go, you know, that's that's not right. And you, it's just, you just change it. That makes sense. Um, it's always a work in progress, right? That's right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Another audience question is, what are a couple of inexpensive decor elements to elevate a family living room? Inexpensive? Yes. Um, well, I would say on the inexpensive level, I would just say great pillows, throw pillows, um, that if you sew, you can actually just find some fabrics on sale and make, you know, make the slip covers and get inserts, just buy them online. Uh, so pillows and throws, I think, are a, a great way to, to give some personality to a room without without spending a lot of money. That makes sense. And a visible uh, and functional element too. Right. When you start getting into rugs and things like that, it can be more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on wallpaper? Is it in or out right now? And how about in the foreseeable future? Uh, actually, uh, well, wallpaper's always been in with certain people. And I have seen a huge trend toward wallpaper lately. Uh, it just seems people just have a giant crush on wallpaper. Uh, I, I've never used it in one of my homes. Um, I'm more of a paint girl, but uh, it definitely is making a huge comeback. And I, I think it will forever come back. There's some gorgeous ones out there. We used um, uh, the Scalamandre zebras in our bathroom last Ooh. year. It's a tiny bathroom, so it's you know easier to justify it. And um, I, but now I'm like, well, we can never leave the house because I don't want to leave that. <laughs> <laughs> you spent so much on those sheets, right? Exactly. Hopefully, the next person um, you know will appreciate it as much as I do. <laughs> um, Okay, here's another kind of question with a bigger budget. I have a budget of $5,000 for any home improvement right now. So I know that I completely renovate any room in my house, but what are some design changes I could make with that amount of money to have a nice visual impact? Mm, well, it's kind of, it's sort of hard to give feedback without seeing the room and to right. see what, what you have now. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, $5,000 isn't going to get you a pair of sofas, probably. So uh, right. I would say, you know, perhaps some great artwork, 
And, you know, as I said earlier, I always think that paint where if it's needed is a great way to, to spend a budget. Um, but I think, you know, you can get a beautiful, beautiful rug, some beautiful rugs, um, um, perhaps some window treatments. Uh, it depends. I, I would have to really see the room and the space to, to say that here's where I think you should spend your money. Absolutely. Um, this is another one kind of about, um, that might be hard, but what is your favorite furniture style or why? Um, I would say I have, I like um, eclectic, not quite as eclectic as one of that one photo I showed you, but um, I like to mix uh, a few styles and keep and just like find things I love. Like I have a turn of the century chair that was really special to my mom. Mm -hmm. I, but then I, I have some very modern art and uh, I like to just have around me things that I love and I'm a treasure hunter. So uh, I, I like having a mix. So that's perfect because the next question we have is about sources. So do you have any suggestions for sources for artwork specifically that doesn't break the bank? I would say, okay, I would say to go online and Google your heart out, you know, with looking for emerging art. I, in fact, I would Google emerging artists. There are so many talented, wonderful artists out there. So I would say, well, first of all, buy a canvas and see how good you are. <laughs> and then, but, yeah. then, like, but you never know. Um, uh, but, but then I would say, just start looking. There are lots and lots of sites online. And also with art, you know, there are originals and then there are prints. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can buy some gorgeous prints at really good prices. Um, so sometimes if you don't have a huge budget, that might be the way to go. It depends on how much space you have. But I would say start shopping online to begin with. That's great. What are some of your other favorite sources for other home items? <clears throat> Traveling. Yeah. You know, I, I, think, I think travel, um, my main reason for loving travel is treasure hunting. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, keep your eye out wherever you go, wherever you go, whoever's home you're in for ideas. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think just, just look and see and find. The, in some of the images you showed, you know, it, it, I was impressed at how just naturally some of the more antique pieces fit, you know, pieces that felt older. And in, it feels less intimidating about adding them to a room. It's kind yes. of vintage and um, antique and like, is antique hunting usually a fail proof? Well, yeah, I love, you know, I, I, have a, uh, I have a few really beautiful antiques in my house mm -hmm. and then I have modern pieces in my house. Mm -hmm. Most of my upholstered pieces are sort of up to date, what's ever trending, but then I like to mix the rest with it. And I, and um, again, it comes down to not just any antique, but the things that I like, where I like the lines and I like the colors and I like the feeling mm -hmm. uh, and everyone's different. Absolutely. Um, so this is a, you know, another kind of opinion one, but what one home design trend that you're ready to see fall out of fashion? Mm. No, it's well, hard. Let's see. I am kind of tired of this, the square modern houses that are basically cubes. Mm -hmm. um, I, Cause I, I keep thinking about nineties houses, houses that were built in the nineties and what they look like now. So I'm wondering how those houses are gonna look in 10 or 20 or 30 years. So I wouldn't mind seeing um, uh, those go out of trend um, because they seem to just look alike. Yeah. It, it, you know, I don't know how to tell one from the next. Um, I personally am getting a little tired of mid-century 
mainly because I'm mid-century. <laughs> I, you know, I grew up with, I grew up then, I had my parents' furniture, uh, some of which I still have in my inventory, by the way. And uh, uh, so I, I, that's been around for quite a while. I'm kind of ready to see that go back into the background. Um, I, I'm, I'm tired of the, and I think I said this earlier, I'm very tired of the cookie cutter modern look. Yeah. where you you go in and it's every single modern place has the same furniture mm -hmm. without the personality i like to see the person in the room you know i like to see who they are all of those examples are pretty generic looks too yes you know, that makes sense that you know you feel that personality is missing yes and here in denver we have a lot of neighborhoods where it'll be older houses, you know, and then uh, one of those like box, you know, container home thing. Yes. All stacked up together. That all is what they look like. Yes. Yeah. And they're, they're, it's sort of shy, like jolting to see it. Yes. Yes. You know, the street. So it'll be interesting to see how that ages. Yeah. To see, well, yeah, just like, you know, we all age and, and houses age as well. I, I think, you know, there, there's, uh, there are certain styles that age beautifully. I mean, think about how charming Victorian homes are still and, uh, uh, you know, certain styles and then how uncharming other styles uh, grew, grew to be. Yeah. Um, one more question from the audience. What are your recommendations to mitigate sound from so many hard surfaces? Wow. You know, I am probably not the best person to answer that question, um, except to say uh, that I know that rugs mm -hmm. really help with sound. I know that, um, and I think I think upholstered anything upholstered soft will absorb sound. I know I've gone into certain restaurants where I go, this place is packed why can I hear you? You know, yeah. so there, are, there are some secrets out there, but like, if you get the answer to that question, I would love to know it. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably also different in like, at, um, you know, uh, retail and, um, you know. Yes, yes. Like but, but I, I do know, I do know that as soon as we put rugs on the floors of hard surfaces, the sound really improves. Yeah, totally. Here's another kind of specific one. Do you have a favorite shade of off-white paint for walls that doesn't have any icky yellow or pink undertones? Oh. A good well, classic I love, white. Uh, what's that? A good classic white, it sounds like they're looking for. Yeah, well, I, I think there are quite a few. I mean, I, I have my own house painted, uh, I think it's called Glass of Milk by Ben Moore, Ooh. but uh, uh, yeah, I think I have a whole list somewhere, so I'd love to get them to the person who wants that answered. I can't tell you off the top of my head, but I agree. You don't. I hate the whites that get too yellowy or too pink, or too gray. Yes. You just there's that one. You you want that warm white. Totally. You don't want one. You know, there's some yellows where it just looks like there's nicotine staining the wall or something. Exactly. Kind of grimy exactly. feeling. Exactly. And then like ones where it's too gray and sterile also bothers me. Right, right. It's funny how a simple white can be so hard too. Oh, um, I mean, the, there are whites and whites and whites and whites and whites and whites. Absolutely. Forever. Choice overload in the paint aisle. Yes. Great. Well, thank you so much to everyone for joining us for today's presentation and a special thank you again to Meredith for this great information. At this time, we invite you to provide your feedback on the webinar by answering the following poll question. On a scale from 1 to 10, how likely are you to recommend this webinar to a friend or other CU Boulder alumni? We thank you in advance for submitting your feedback. As a reminder, all webinar attendees will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording of this presentation as well as a survey.
To view upcoming webinars as well as previous recordings, please visit our website at colorado.edu slash business slash alumni. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is next Tuesday, June 22nd, as Pat Myers, the State of Colorado's Executive Director of the Office of Economic Development and International Trade and the Chief Economic Recovery Officer, presents on Colorado State's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. In the meantime, have a great rest of your day. Thank you for your time and go Buffs.